this is always really comfortable for me. <coughs> we fly together a lot, and it's really comfortable then. <laughs> OK. So here we go. Now, um, just act like it's normal. You're not doing it yet. Act like it's normal. It's like I'm here. I've never You're... been interviewed by somebody being licked. Sorry. Yes, you have. I haven't. Yes, I you have. have. One time. OK, he, he can... gets self-soothed by licking my hands. I can't explain it. Now, um, now, you went to the same drama school as I did. Did you do that because I had gone? Yes, yeah. Well, and what year were you there? Don't I do honest. not know. Really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was, I know when it was. When? It, well, it was before England had heating and showers. Right. Do you remember I, that? That was then. Yeah, yeah I remember they, that. No, they had no shower the system. The pioneer stuff. You'd have to squat in that shower with a tube as it burns your, you know, remember yes. that? Yes. And you had to put 50p in the meters. Can you show them a wushka? What's a wushka? Oh, come on. That thing where the extra movement they showed us to relax. It's I didn't so go humiliated. to your drama school. I didn't get into drama school. I auditioned for about uh, every drama school oh you could possibly God. get into. Because what I are these act. questions then? Well, I guess I should answer. Eventually, them. I did get into one, but you never heard of it. You did get into one. Eventually, I tried to get into every single one, but nobody had taught me how to act. So I. That's um, better. That's well, no, I, it meant I didn't get in. But I, I was living alone in a bed sit, just me. So lonely, you know those carpets that Why look like. Why do they call it a bed sit? Well, because you—that's all the room you've got in there. So I, I went through two winters. I remember I had to mount a hair dryer because you know they had nothing. That sounds. They had sexual. the flickering coals. Do you yeah. remember? Yes. It was sexual, Carrie. You don't have to point that out. Sad. So I. Uh, so I got into drama school because for two years I I rehearsed Juliet in my room, but I didn't know how to act. So when I went to Rada. I knew Juliet was really sad in the scene. So I went on stage going, my dog is dead. My dog is dead. My dog is dead. Because if I say that, I could cry. And so you could see them going, is, is there a dog in Romeo? And, <laughs> and I had a wimple. I'm not making this up. You made your I own wimple? I made a wimple. And uh, yeah, because I knew that Juliet wore one. And, uh, and try to get through a doorway with a wimple on your head without ripping your throat out. I'm going out. to right after this. <laughs> and then I was really nervous. I said, um, uh, William Shakespeare by Ruby Wax and Juliet. And then I started going, my dog is dead. My dog is dead. And then I started with the worst English accent. Oh, no. I oh. beat you there. No. Give no, me yours. But Give me yours. I Give don't me... have to. You can see the what first Star your, Wars. What was your... <laughs> yeah. Governor Tarkin, I thought I recognized your foul stench when I arrived on board. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> really bad. Yeah. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, so you're right. Mine was, the, you know, the Juliet saying? Yeah. This is my audition. Wait, let me see if I can remember. I really thought you're supposed to, you know, when you do, uh, when you make noises, like, alack, alack. Swear to God, is it not that I, with loathsome breath and shrieks like mandrakes torn from the earth, that living mortals hearing them run mad? That's what I actually did. That's what I actually. But that way, it gets you worse. Shakespeare in in the scene. She she. Uh, they say that she knocks her brains out with Tybalt's bone, and I didn't know it was a metaphor, so I brought a turkey leg. I on still stage. don't know that it is. Yeah. <laughs> I a brought it on for his penis? No, she, meaning she was upset, and so she was so sad, she took her cousin's Tibble's bone and smashed it on. They did that in those days. Did I go off? Yes. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah, that turned me off. Tibble's bone twice. That's oh my how God. bad that audition was. And when I got off stage, they didn't call my name, and I said, D uh, did you call my name? And they went, no. And that so, wait, you got in, though. I finally got into a dump in Glasgow, which was like an ashtray with stoplights. <laughs> who wanted to go to Glasgow? There was like an, only an idiot in there beside me who um, had to go right, left, right, left to That's remember a good which, accent, though. which foot went where. Um, oh. Oh, are you turning me off for a reason? Eventually, Gary's going to come up on the mic. Gary's not turned off. As you can see, he's quite aroused. He's very excited but about that woman over there. So then. Um, then I decided. Here, talking to my tits. All right. <laughs> I've talked in those tits. <laughs> I've talked in those tits too often. All right, there we go. Then I decided. <laughs> this really sucks, doesn't it? 
but in a good way. In a nice way. Yeah. <laughs> so just tell them and I'll repeat it until, loud. Yeah. Oh, so what Ruby was going to say in a full Nobody voice. Nobody can see you. It's going really well. <laughs> yeah. No. That she went to Glasgow, and I'm jealous. And uh, she's tell going them a little to do about the Glasgow. Oh, there we are. Of, of Scotland now. No, I'll tell you the history of Scotland. Oh, good. There was a. <laughs> they told me a hundred times. No, I'm off again. Oh my God. I know it's so. Well, wait. Let's I'm see if again. it's possible to. Well, anyway. Can you hear her if she doesn't have the vocal acuity no. of a no? Okay. There was a battle in Scotland, and each side was jealous of the other one's tartan because they both wanted the Burberry. Place. Tartan jealous. So Burberry. they could wear it in the inside of their raincoats. Uh, anyway, then old uh, Mel McGibson ran down the hill. What do I know? Don't be looking oh, at me. With the no, I was actually full on interested. That's yeah. so and he sad. Said, I know. She said she knows. <laughs> Let's shave our legs and put the contents on our head and wear them as those hairball hats. That's why she and got then, into mental illness. That's stuff. right. And then you take the, the entrails of a cat and you blow into them, and there you've got the beautiful music. Wow. Yeah. Now, who knew that? Anyway, they said exactly. no underpants because, you know, that's why they wear the, uh, the sporin on their fronts. That, you know what? In World War I, the uh, Germans were actually afraid. Did only I do it afraid. on script? This yeah. I know. They're only afraid of. Uh, Scottish soldiers, because all the British soldiers weren't soldiers yet. But the Scottish were scary, and they called them ladies from hell, <laughs> because they wore the kilts. So they had skirts on, and they were very afraid. The oh, end. That's my only contribution for the evening. <laughs> OK, go. Okay. So anyway, I got sick of that, because who wants that genitalia running over your head for three years? So I went to, I said, I'm going to get into the Royal Shakespeare Company with no talent at all. But the drive, because my parents were immigrants, you know that. We have the drive of, because you know, we're used to leaving countries quickly, but then surviving, you know, scuttling, uh, scuttling with pianos on our backs. We're used to moving. And we're determined. That's in our, there'll never be a race like this. Um, anyway, so I knew, get into the Royal Shakespeare Company. And so when they weren't looking, <laughs> I, um, I did the most nauseating again um, audition speech. But by now, people thought I was kidding. <laughs> Because they were so bad. They thought it was funny. They thought it was funny. Oh, that's good. I dressed up as a country wench. You know, there's a lot of... For the same speech? Same speech. And oh. wore my underpants on my head. And then, you know, brought this up to here. So I had like a cleavage on my forehead. And then I, I spoke in early porno, you know, with my Bo Peep stick. Going, oh, no kind, sir. I'm not a wench. I am. You know, they didn't know. And they laughed and laughed and thought, that's hilarious. <laughs> I was so totally they, serious. That is, but so that is good. Then I got in, and uh, <laughs> that's a big deal. But I was so bad that when I was on stage, people, well, Alan Rickman was in my ear. People on stage, and Michael Horton would hand me notes while I was acting saying, please find another profession. <laughs> You're awful. You're awful. Like I would get this from other actors. Have you done a lot of acting? I should know this. No, why, I know you've why done. Why would you know? But I know that you've done. Your show and that and writing and thing, but I would really like to see you like in a, in a, in a in straight a series. play. Yeah, like in a cop show. <laughs> you know, nobody's ever asked me. I am asking you. All right, I'm there. I'm begging. I'll play you. the Have list and cop done to your cop series. Like, well, I played Wench for that season and then for a seaweed. cop series. I no, don't think so. No, I was. So. Uh, there was no cops back then. I played plague-ridden uh, whore stroke nun. I'm just trying to go back. Was there a cop? No. But then when I got out, because I w they wouldn't give me any parts well, the, where you speak, I was a, fanta I was a Shakespearean ashtray. And then I was, uh, uh, I was a, a, a nymph, where I danced. Juliet Stevenson was the other nymph. And we looked like women. Everybody got famous. <laughs> She's famous, just not for the same thing. Not for the same reason. But Juliet and I were dressed as bar mitzvah women. So they, we had these like blue wigs. And oh, then, that's right. Shakespeare was bar mitzvah. Yeah. Yes. And then we jumped, we came out of a, <clears throat> there was an elevator that took us up. And then we had to do this grotesque dance with Alan Rickman sitting there. And all that had to happen was you'd catch his eye and we pished on stage. And Juliet Stevenson actually did go to the bathroom on the stage. I am the I'm sure she'll be very glad She's you She's always thanking that. me for that. <laughs> I saw that happen. 
for laughing we so laughed hard. during the show and you'd hear people going i didn't know there was somebody from chicago in the tempest <laughs> there should have been i think that's what yeah. really was missing so i was that kind of an actress in you did you did you think you were going to stay in england and be an actress did Ever? i yeah <laughs> oh no i know no, so you just used it. No, my thing was I couldn't, I didn't go into show business that I, w I was in already. The trick would have been to get out. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I didn't turn that trick. But it's still hope. There's hope for me yet. Would you ever go to something like that? Like the bullshit. I mean, I, to me, that was my dream. The only two Americans that ever got in there <laughs> in the recently were me and Dr. Kildare. So I was very, yeah, what's his at name? At RADA. No, at the RSC. Okay. Yeah. He got there? He got there before me, yeah. And he sucked too. So, well, but the way I got in was for three years, I did tongue exercises. Did you do that at drama school? You know, ta da 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 la 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 ta da da He does la, la, la. <laughs> Really? To get the and English teach... accent I have today, yeah. That's anyway, how you met your husband also. Then I, no, I got into the Royal Shakespeare Company because they really liked what I could do with my tongue. So that's how I got in. And the husband came many years later, way later. I was already, then I started working with, I don't know if you guys know French and Saunders. And yeah. What happened to them? And uh, Tracy Ullman, she was the other person in it. And uh, we wrote a show called Girls on Top, which was, um, it was, uh, we were like, you know, we were losers and women had never made fun of women before. Do you know what I'm saying? Now Men always crack stop. better jokes. Yeah. But for a woman to be funnier about a woman had never been done before. Really? Never in England. You know, they were always like, you know, the babe, the bimbo, the, oh, lovely, I didn't know that, sir. Pat me on the bottom. You know, that's what they were, you know, especially with the pythons. So for us to play like, a, you know, real out there, you know, I played like some American asshole, and then Dawn played a retarded person, <laughs> and, and Jennifer was some lesbian, and Joan Greenwood was in it, and we all lived together. It was, it was hilarious. We lived Two, together also? We also in real life lived together. Because we wrote that first show, Girls on Top, we thought it was just us, you know, and nobody would ever see it. <laughs> oh. You know how you do that? It's like a party, and then suddenly... They saw it. They saw That's, it, and it's people... It's better that way, I think. Well, yeah, that was how Ab Fab was done, That's too. That's what this is like, isn't it, guys? <laughs> it's really real. So this weird. is really happening. This is really <laughs> happening. No, it's not. So you did Girls on Top. You did absolutely fabulous after that. Yeah. yeah. Well, Joanna Lumley was this real loser, and she was, she was down in her career. When you're an icon, you only last a certain amount of time. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> My mother is an icon. I am icon adjacent. <laughs> uh, but my, the character I played is an icon. I just want to, yeah. you understand? OK, so I don't want to get that icon hostility. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, I'm you know just a really goes. meat and potatoes kind of down to earth. Down to earth from where? And <laughs> did I need a shovel to get there? <laughs> no. Anyway. But I, I really need to go through the down to earth thing with you because it really bothers well, me. Well, we can work on that. Yeah. Because I am down okay. to earth. And I know. I can bring but that the to the table. Thing that, I'm impressed by all this other stuff, and I am, and we can go over that later. <laughs> but I'm yeah. unbelievably impressed and upset, even, that you went back to school at our mutual age, though I believe you're a couple months older. <laughs> and you went to Oxford. Yeah. The end. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. Who does that? I mean, that's... Well, I got... Uh, I swear to God, and you can Google this, I went to, in Evanston, Illinois, Busy Beaver Nursery School, and I was asked to leave. <laughs> so I thought, I'm going to show them. So I went to Oxford at age 409. I said, screw you. Let's... <laughs> no, but really, that's... And you studied... Um, well, I was interested... Can I go back a little bit in time? No. Okay. Then I'll go forward. All right, no, go ahead. Go Where back am I time. going? All right, just pretend it's yesterday. Um, so I, uh, I was interested in the, the brain, and I went to Berkeley a long time ago because I wanted to understand how, you know, as we both do. But what's Berkeley more isn't, isn't good for brains. No, but also you couldn't look at a brain that, wasn't, that was 
they were dead then. You had to look at a dead person. Now, of course. Everybody pays for that. <laughs> um, but you couldn't, so only 10 years ago could you look inside and watch somebody thinking. So it, I had to wait that long. You've oh, upset thought, someone. Is that making you nervous? She went to Berkeley. <laughs> only for a second. But, um, and I, I won't even tell you how I got in there. But anyway, so. <laughs> no, so you. you so, so, when, so then I. Um, let me just back up a little bit. I became the poster girl for mental illness in England because I accidentally said to a, um, a, to a mental health charity they could use my photo because they said, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. But it's better when you talk to this right. press. So it's just, okay. yeah, so a little bit of palsy here. <laughs> I'm going to wake up tomorrow with a... All right, so I'm going to get cancer on my left side now from... So I, uh, did a sh I, I, I said to a mental health, this leads to why I went to Oxford, mental health charity, yes, I would do a picture for them. And I thought it was just going to be in their brochure to raise money, right? But they put giant pictures of me all over the UK, <laughs> all over, looking like, like the immigrants we came from, you know. And it said, and I'm not I can't write material like this, one in four people have mental illness. <laughs> The one in, one in, and here it gets better. Who wrote this? One in five people have dandruff. I have both. Did it say that on the poster? On my children's life. No, but on my it, yes, it said it that. It talked on the, about dandruff in a mental health poster. In the same poster. Like which one's worse, the chicken or the egg? Depends on the dandruff, I think. Yeah. No. That's not. Well, congratulations. So, yeah. so, when I so thought, were you recognized by people that they oh, went, yeah, they said, oh, was a crazy crazy woman. Woman. one. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, then um, suddenly I had a new career. <laughs> and, um, and I thought, you know what I'll do, because now I'm screwed. I'll write a show, and I'll make that look like it was my publicity poster. <laughs> called, one in four people have mental illness, one in five people have dandruff. That's brilliant. Am I a genius? There's the old immigrant spirit. So I, I did write the show. I wrote the show and I performed it in mental institutions. Because, you know, I needed to workshop it. And those and are a very good audience, I know. Who's a better audience, you know? They're really strict on that the stuff, The bipolars yeah. used to say, I laughed, I cried. <laughs> and then, um, and the psychotics, they still write to me. They still think the show's I'm gonna going kill on. you. <laughs> So they, we'd all have... And in a way, no, go the ahead. show is still... So I'd perform in the mental institutions because we didn't charge them money. Uh, Not you real can't, money. You can't. Because they don't... Yeah. Money. Well, they, they're unconscious, most of them. <laughs> so um, I, that was the tube. I wasn't picking my nose. You know, when you see an audience... And I always like think this. that you're going to be thought that you're doing something... So never mind. Go uh, ahead. So, they, um, so the, the gift back to me was I could stay overnight in the mental institutions and then join them in the smoking room. Well, you know... The greatest theater in the world takes place in those smoking rooms. That's why I went back to smoking. <laughs> it's true. I swear to God, I'd given up for two years, visited a mental hospital, just and curiosity. <laughs> and <laughs> Well, you made a career out of it, I'm too. In, that's why. Yeah. I am not mentally ill. I just wanted to get some more lines. I wanted some funny stuff. Yeah. Like Ivy used to say, but, how do you get a poltergeist out of a vacuum cleaner? You see, we can't make up stuff like that. And another one said, Wait, what did she use? How do you I've get got, a I poltergeist swear this, out of a vet? She that's said, I've me. I've got a communist living in my back molar. <laughs> Go to a no, cocktail that's party. That's really good. No, that's, I know. No, I can't yeah. find that material. No, no. So I did that show, and then I used to say, we used to steal food from the anorexics because they didn't mind. So then, uh, <laughs> then, um, then the show took off, and suddenly it went to real theaters, you know, with unmentally ill people. That's and, not entirely true. No, there were some people in there. As a matter of fact, one guy, I in, recently, I was, I was starting my show, and the guy was going, <laughs> you know, and I thought it was a standing ovation. And I, I took a bow before I even started the show, and then it was a man with Tourette's. I didn't And know. that's a swear word? <laughs> no, he, he barked at me, and I thought it was my audience cheering. It was well, his, in a way. In a way, it's better than nothing. I've never actually been around a Tourette's. Have you? Oh, yeah. Really? Are you kidding? You perform in mental institutions for two years. You see it all. That's true. Well, I haven't performed in them yet. You've just I'm been to follow you. Anyway, that was fun. There's nothing more satisfying. How long did you do that for? Two years. And how do you get the bookings? 
you just show up. They, ain't they going don't care. They're, they're like not going anywhere. They're yeah. tied to the chair. Yeah. Yeah, you fucking better be good. So anyway, so just like one performance, one mental hospital. Every, every I, I'm the only person that can say I played bedlam. <laughs> I, I could and say it and get could away you say with that? it. Could you say that? Yeah, but you mean it. I really did yeah. it. And they'd show me, you know, I'd, I'd come early, and they'd, oh, I love these people. They'd show me their rooms, and it was, one was dressed as Cleopatra. She was in her 80s, you know, and it was just touching. And another one had made me a kind of sculpture out of toilet paper rolls. I, you know, you can't top no, these no, people. No. I miss them to this day. You don't have to. No, we're, we're waiting I'm going for back. you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going There's back. There's some out there <laughs> for tonight a <laughs> well, little. when I do my U.S. tour. Yes, well, I'll, I'll, I'll come find that. Anyway, then the show went to normal theaters, blah. And, um, and then they I- they call normal theaters. Whatever, but they, uh, we, we d I did the same thing in the second half of the show. It would be, you know, we'd have the interval, and then they would ask, they would start talking and asking questions. And it was unbelievable. Now they were huge theaters. There were like sometimes, you know, a lot of people in there. And, you know, people would stand up and go, um, I, one, old, one guy, he was very butch, he said, I've been on antidepressants for 20 years, I never told my wife. And she was sitting next to him. And then somebody down here would say, um, I jump, you know, people started to talk to each other and it was like the Muppets and it was thrilling. Because, you know, mentally ill people have no place to meet. We have no, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous got a place on every corner. S you know, and how did they get that together? Because they're drunk. <laughs> but but men, you know, we don't have a place. So the English, who are known to be anally retentive, you know, famously mm -hmm. leaving your sofa with cushions stuck to their backside, they um, they started to talk all night. And wherever I went, there would be these unbelievable conversations. So um, and sometimes heartbreaking, you know. And uh, so I thought, on my night off, I would open the theater for the public to come in. And I would bring neuroscientists and doctors and a whole team of therapists. You, we'd offer help. I'd serve cookies just like AA. That's awesome. Yeah. And then they'd have a point of reference because people were tearing their hair out. They don't know where to go for help. There is no place. You know, and they get on waiting lists and, and they're terrified of speaking because they, they'll get fired. So that was my kind of, you know, I was allowed to be narcissistic and then they'd give it back, you know, so I could kind of... Uh, forgive myself for still standing on stage and talking about Talking about yourself behind your back. That's you the only such way a to genius. do it. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a great thing to do. I actually did go to a group of, uh, it was affective disorder, they said. So that's for Meaning bipolar. It works. And I said, well, it's not, it was, it was not, um, not an alcoholic bipolar people. So I thought, what the hell are they going to talk about? <laughs> and I went. And first of all, it's a really small group. And second, here they talked about medication the entire time. Well, I'm on Liptopore, and they I find that. that that. So it, it was Ours. the most boring. <laughs> and it wasn't. And there was no supervision. You, you do have to have somebody to control. Or it's it. easy to get a sort of a, a drunk to supervise an AA meeting, but I don't think it's that easy to get people to supervise the. You mean that the schizophrenic taking care of the borderline personality? Imagine that. Imagine they would be like a liquidizer. You oh, know, man, yeah. I would, it would be like a mess that in so there. Much. Can you imagine? No, Just get that the would cameras be great. rolling. So you do that now. You go and do your show and... No, so then what happened was I did that show. Then I thought, um, I started to... I was so interested in how your brain works. And by now, you could look in a real live one, a live one. And I thought, I got to find out about this. I became fascinated and obsessive. I get these, you know... I didn't know that. So, do you? No, I thought I you know. were sort of... A yeah, more just calm line, flat yeah. line. Yeah. So I decided I would study the brain and I... Uh, and, 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 you know, how, how it works, how you think. Because n neurology used to be um, just about the, you know, the meat of the matter. But now you can study how you think. Well, now, you know, when we were a kid and we were getting stoned and we go, what, you know, who are we? Well, now I thought I could look in and see <laughs> and have an answer before I dropped dead. So, um, so I, I, I found out who the, one of the founders was of mindfulness-based therapy 
cognitive based therapy is about how to use the mind, how the mind works. So mindfulness. I mindfulness hmm. before it was, you know, the zeitgeist. Yeah. And I was so ashamed to tell people I was studying my, you know, because I thought it was, you know, I'd have to get one of those blue elephants with a thousand arms sitting in it. You know, those ones, the ding, ding with the little red I'm lipstick. I'm so thrilled to say I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> That's Do we have any people who I'm worship? From, I'm from the Bay Area. It's Ganesh. You know, it's Ganesh. Oh, Ganesh. Yeah. Oi, That's, Ganesh. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> It's like yeah. a yeast infection, okay. yeah. except out of your Not nose. With music. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so anyway, I, but you do get to study how the mind works. And so I, uh, I hunted down the founder of it. And he was a professor at Oxford. And I got in my car, and I was, I was really sick. This is seven years ago when I ended up. Whatever we do, Battle of the Bands, you're sicker. I know. I bow down to that. Thank you, because really, I, it's important to me to you know be more mentally ill. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to be mentally ill, anyway, go yeah, ahead. It's Battle of the Bands. There's no yeah. question. No, I okay. just have vanilla depression. She's the yeah. Monty. So, um, so anyway, that back then I said I'm not gonna. You know, I, I was sitting on a chair for seven months, you know, and even the shower was dangerous. So I said, this is never going to happen again. Uh, so that's why I was so interested in how the mind works. Maybe I could regulate those chemicals. That's why I looked for Mark Williams, who was the founder of this thing. And then I got to Oxford, and he said, I said, just tell me, wh what happens in the brain? Because I don't want the fluffy stuff. You know, I'm not into the, you know, hugging your inner elf. I'm not from that school <laughs> of thought. Or my past life. You know, 2014, and people are asking me, what, what? Yeah, like we met in the past, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was told, I swear to God, in 1472, I was a window cleaner. <laughs> the fuck? And to me, this is more than enough. I'm going to change yeah. my mind when I'm near to death. But go ahead. Okay. Uh, anyway, so, um, so, uh, so he said, well, if you want to learn about the brain, it's that you'd have to get your master's at Oxford. And so, um, <laughs> go figure. Well, uh, considering my SAT and scores. And he suggested that. No, he said, if you want to study it, you have to get in there. He was laughing. Oh. Like, ha ha. Well, the next thing you oh. knew, I did that audition speech again. <laughs> now, I got some of my grades together. And... Uh, plugging them together. And then um, I give great interview. <laughs> That's all I, but, but you had, I had some grades. Did you graduate high regular school. college? No, I never, I went to Berkeley and. But you graduated high school. I graduated high school. I didn't, That's harder, yeah. Get out. Please don't tell anyone that. Oh my God, do people uh, know that? Just this group. Just this people. Yeah. <laughs> That's terrible. No, they do know. Well, I was a chorus girl, Ruby. It's more important. Ask my mom. So, um. <laughs> So anyway, anyway, I can't get into Oxford until I finish high school. So it's a longer trip for it's me. It's a longer, it'll so take. So you, did you have to get SAT scores to no, get in? No, you don't have, a, if I had to get my SATs, to this day, to this day it makes me gag. 478. I don't know what that it's means. It, take a house plant and give it a spelling bee. They couldn't get 478. <laughs> My mother went to the school and said, I think the machine was broken. Wait, oh, this was when you were young? When do, we, when do we do SATs? Tomorrow? I didn't do it, so. Oh, you don't even know what no, they are. No, you have to help me. We're going to have to most go way people, back. Yeah. It, yeah. Uh, it, most people get about 600, 700 in an SAT. you got to be really subterranean. To get 478. I still wake up and I go, 468. <laughs> I go, not me. I don't have that. I don't. My mom made me take it again, and I got 467. <laughs> what are the questions? There are things like, what's, what's different here? A cow, a, a tree, a chicken, and a, and a, and a coleslaw. And, and you're supposed to see which one isn't the, doesn't fit in. Wait, I have another they, question. To me, they're all the same. Wait, call on me. I have another you. question. Thank you. Now I forgot the question. No, coleslaw, coleslaw. Do they have math? That's the part where I know I can't do it that because it's too shameful. Nothing. So there was math in it and chickens? Math and chickens. And I got Whoa. both. Both weren't good. And you needed to get the math and the chicken stuff together to get into Oxford. Do you know how bad Oxford. it was? They, they had little <laughs> squares, right? Little two lines that you're supposed to blacken in. Oh, I've seen those. Yeah, I thought it was an essay. So I tried to write in the little squares. <laughs> Thought it was an essay. On what? On chickens! 
so anyway, then I, uh, I, I, I didn't get, it wasn't a good time for me, high school. So, but it's a good time now. Now, because some of us develop later. Yes, I got breast yeah. last no, week. Really, yeah. <laughs> no, so so you go in and they say, show us your SATs. No, I didn't have to show. They're not interested in SAT. What are they interested in? I did time? go to school before that. I have to say, um, after working in TV all those years, I decided, uh, you know, I always know leave the party before it leaves you. You know that one. I knew that my career was heading toward. Um, it was a great. I know that place. You know. Yeah. Uh, now you're going to end up on uh, reality shows playing, you know, eating a cockroach, and or in my case, and I did this. This is how desperate showbiz is. I did a show called Celebrity Shark Bait, <laughs> where we were sent to Cape Town. Even the dog is has upset left. by that. And there was another girl in it. Richard E. Grant was in it, so let's mention that one. Yes, he tries to hide that one, but he was in it's Celebrity Shark Bait. It's important not to hide those things. Those no, things it's are... out now. And she, another girl, we don't know her name, was wearing fully exposed breasts. And so they didn't film with Richard and I for months, right? We're just hanging around, because Milky Breasts, is, they're filming her in a, <clears throat> in a walk-in freezer, I swear to God, where they had, go with me, dead pigs, frozen ones, hanging. And they made her sit there in her bikini because they told her, they took shots of her, they were getting her ready for the cold water. P.S. We were going to wear wetsuits. <laughs> and she'd say, do you think I'm being exploited? No, wait. Are her tits here? No. Her tits are out? Her tits are everywhere, OK? You can have that? They're th no. Obviously, they were the, for the camera crews. Yes, for the ah, camera crews, okay. they were out. OK, I'm sorry. Then the day of the dive came. I mean, this has nothing to do with neuroscience. And yes, there was it does. <laughs> And there was a woman, and she, it said shark lady on her windbreaker. <clears throat> and I remember her going to Richard and I, perfectly safe. We've never had an incident. We've been doing this for 25 years. Perfectly safe. And then we noticed she had three fingers. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Milky wouldn't get in the water. So they threw Richard and I down to the bottom of the cage. Richard, the old ones, they thought, well, they're redundant. And so we're sitting down there. And then this 30-foot thing comes at us. And all the last shot is, is just us screaming and pee coming out of our collars because we're so fucking scared. So no that was wonder the end of you went career. to Oxford. <laughs> That's what, yeah. Then I thought, wave goodbye to this career because it's wave Shark goodbye Bay, to you. And I say Oxford. <laughs> So then that was the last of the low part? Is that uh, the lowest that the point? No, well, the lowest was when I had to, um, I was asked to be, I don't, can you say these things? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Again, on my children's life, I got an email asking me to be the face of vaginal dryness. No! I have the, I have the email. I'm I begging you. I, why didn't you do that? They offered five to seven thousand pounds, and I said, "Please, five, because it's such an honor." Uh, I mean, I would have done that yeah. just for the. No, if I would have done it, I would have gone on oh. TV shows, but I would have made the sound of sandpaper, oh. right? And then I would have <laughs> sat down and said, "So, what's the problem?" And then lit a match. There's no business <laughs> like show business, like no. Everything about it is appealing. <laughs> Everything! It doesn't stop. The no, fun doesn't that's stop. that's phenomenal. Yeah. I haven't had that. I'm really... I'll send you the I'm email. I'm so jealous. I know. Can you believe that? No, I'm you so should make that into a, pa a painting. <laughs> Don't you think? I would get that on my wall. Will you be the face of vaginal dryness? <laughs> but there's art for you. Love. Yeah. Anyway, I... I, I that's the low point. And then I thought, uh, now I'm going to study the brain. Let's get as far from the vagina as we can. So I, <clears throat> then I was interested in that. So I, I went to Oxford. They gave me an interview. I said, I'm studying this anyway, even if you don't get me in. But then I did. It was a miracle. And everybody in my class looked at me with such disgust. And they were younger than me. So I, I told them I had that disease where you age really fast. <laughs> you know, that Gary Oldman had? No, no, no. You cut off your head and count the rings. <laughs> That's that's the that's the legitimate. That's hard to name. stay at Oxford in that yeah. condition, um, but they. What so? Okay, and then you went to Oxford for how long? Two years, and you wear the bat clothes. 
you know. Oh, I this, saw that. It was awesome. I she have, wore that <clears throat> outfit and got a diploma. Yeah. That was the happiest and day the of my life. I, the vag vaginal, but not. No, I, I really don't have vaginal dry. No, I believe that yeah. would be. I'm that. moist and I graduated. <laughs> so, um, so, so then I thought, let's use this material, you know, for uh, uh, to write a. Um, I used my dissertation and then I spun it into comedy. So, um, so I the, hope the book is. Yeah, it, is a dissertation. Is a dis no I've disguised not as a novel. No, disguise. There's vaginal a little bit in it, but just a little. No, it's um, it's about how your brain works, but it's I I made it bite size, but also what evolution. Really, it was a gift of certain things that you know evolution created for us, but they just don't work now. So there's certain glitches that we've got, which I think are so interesting when you study how this baby works and why it's gotten kind of, you know, we don't have the bandwidth for this. We weren't, we weren't. We weren't prepared for what was coming. So we're eventually going to uh, probably have sex with Gary. But I've told Gary that I have vaginal dryness, so that's not going to happen. <laughs> well, that's why he's got that long tongue. Yeah. OK. <laughs> uh. No, he really does have an abnormally long tongue and no teeth on the side to prevent it from. So he has a little flesh water. He's got a little bit of paralysis, Gary. He's going to do the rest get... of the interview, I think. Now, I've turned into one of those idiots that take their animal everywhere. I never thought I would be this. It's you so turned embarrassing. Into... But, um, <laughs> yeah. You can see hey. how. Can you come get him? I know he's cute. He's unbearably cute. But look what that does to us. You know, I think. Who's the cutest? We Who's can't cutest? compete with that. Maybe it's oh, this reminds me, This reminds me of the SAT test. Which one isn't right? The dog, you, or coleslaw? <laughs> And I, I still don't know. Yeah, no, I don't know, and that's why we're here. <laughs> we're here to find Thanks, out. Abe. This is Abe. Hello. Oh, he's my keeper. Sort of. No, he's my doctor. I wrote it to be really boring. <laughs> no, no, no. But you took on a subject that could potentially be that. It could be. If you weren't, if it wasn't funny, you'd be sleeping. You'd be in a coma. But, uh, but it's funny. It's funny. And... Um, I just don't think anything is more remarkable than you know how this works. And it also, I always felt like when I was with people that were the one in four, you know, like one, two, three, four, <laughs> him, you. Staring and then what at, was the other one? Dandruff, <coughs> mental illness, vaginal dryness. <laughs> that's my that's tongue. my CV. Let's call the whole thing off. <laughs> so anyway, I um, I thought you know. Uh, to me, what's more amazing than how this piece of equipment works? And I always felt not part of the, you know, I always feel like slightly freakish, uh, you know, with other human beings. I always felt like I was the, everybody know knows what, what they're doing. About. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't. Yeah. Like I've never had an internal thought that said, you know, you're fine. What a wonderful thing you're doing. And may yeah. I say how attractive you are today? I haven't had that inner thought. So I always feel, feel really alienated until, you know, when you meet people who have mental illness, then there's my tribe. But after studying the brain, you really realize that under the under the you know the the scalp, we have the same plumbing, and so it makes you feel much more compassion to understand how this thing works. You know, we're at war with ourselves. There's not one brain. There's actually three. Um, there's the, the like the, the dating game. Three, three. And they didn't. None of them dissolved. So one of them is left over from five hundred. Mi million years ago where it was just the basic bit, but it's still here that tells you to eat, mate, and kill, which is only useful if you're working at Goldman Sachs. And then, then there's an, another bit 200 million years later that grew on that uh, was the limbics, and it made you uh, nurture and uh, you know, uh, bond with your offspring rather than eat them. <laughs> and, uh, what about that. both? See, yeah. it's understandable when you think about school fees. But um, <laughs> then the front bit just developed 100,000 years ago. And this is like the master. This is El, you know, the, the, the one in charge. But all three of them are smashed into one. So a lot of times, we're not really in control of which part is at work. So this is why you have women who like to read Heidegger, but also want to screw the plumber. You know, <laughs> or you get, let's say, Clinton. That's a euphemism. Yeah. Um, but you know what I'm saying is that we're at war with ourselves. And that's so interesting because people blame all this conflict on things outside, like the global, you know, or it's their fault or it's their fault. But really, the conflict's in here. 
and unless we declare a truce in our own minds, we're always going to be put, pointing the finger and saying, it's the bully, you know, is that guy. We're bullying ourselves. Thank you. That's my speech on world peace, over and out. Um, and, and, and to understand, you don't have to go into the details, but really to get. Uh, to, I just I found it so interesting that, you know, <clears throat> back, back, back then, we were perfect. You know, we were at one with the world. We only lived three minutes. But, you know, if a predator was behind you, um, you'd fuel up, you know, this part in your brain, the amygdala would light up, and you'd fuel up with these chemicals so you could turn from nice guy to killer maniac and deal with the situation. And then we go back to being calm again. But the point is now we can never cool down because we can't tell if danger is behind us or something is happening 20,000 miles away. This brain can't tell the difference. So, you know, I need to know that there's an earthquake in, boom, 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 you know, everything agitates us. So we can never cool the engines, ever. And, um, and it, it's, and if a physical threat is bad, social threat is even worse now. You know, if I'm not accepted on Facebook or, you know, I, that's even worse than being eaten now. You know, so you get even more of those negative thoughts. I can't, I shouldn't, I didn't, I could. And, and these, this is accelerated now, that kind of punishment for not having enough, not being enough. Not, and it's so interesting to know why. I, and studying hormones and studying the brain and studying all, evolution really gives you a lot of answers where you go, well, why am I so busy? Why do I feel so agitated? And, and, and so, I mean, I just, I wanted to find out for myself, so I then wrote it into a book. No, that's, that would be really interesting. Now I want to go to school, and I you did will. read your book, though, so it's, you know, I'm you halfway there. You yeah, she read my book. But the thing is, it, it ends, the, I, is, is the, the way you think is already interesting enough, but the course was on mindfulness. Now, I don't want to sound like, we're all different, we're all like different fingerprints. But <clears throat> there, I had to get some way that I could cool my system, you know, mm. when it gets too so hyped up. So how do you up. do that? Listen, it's going to work for different people or it's not going to work at all, but <clears throat> it's like doing um, a sit-up. You know, everybody wants a magic pill like tomorrow I'll be cured. And I, I worship at the feet of, of medication. But if it worked, we wouldn't have relapses. So I like the idea that medication is feet. <laughs> so we'll just run. No, so go on. Sorry. So <clears throat> at least with mindfulness, it's an ex exercise that I have to do every day, just the way you would when you do a sit-up. Again, it's because of something physiological is, is happening in your head to eventually bring down. Now, the voices are never going to go. This is bullshit. If somebody thinks they're going to have an empty mind, it's only empty when you're dead. Or blonde. Yeah, or blonde. <laughs> but if, you, if, if there is a way to like uh, get, there's a part of you that watches. Do you know what I'm saying? There's a part of you that isn't the thinker that does, you know, I have to do this, I have to change my light bulb, I have to do this. It, there is a part where you can lean back and kind of watch them go by, those thoughts. Um, and eventually you realize they're not really facts. Now, I can get caught up in them if I want to, but sometimes when I'm on stage, you know, and I start to, let's say, dry or get desperate, you know the feeling. Well, as humans, we get stressed about stress or angry mm -hmm. about angry, and we layer yeah, it on. Right. That is the proclivity of, you know, human nature. So um, with the mindfulness, I don't want to sound like I'm going into fluff land, is if you send your focus to one of your senses, like touch, sound, taste, or smell, you're activating another part of your brain than the one that's like slightly hysterical. This is the amygdala, which makes you go into fight and flight. And this, another bit, insula, is activated when you're touching or smelling or tasting. They can't both be on at the same time. So in a sense, you're tricking your brain. So every time you, you know, focus for a minute or whatever on like hearing, like if you just listen, and you put somebody under a scanner while they're doing that, the cortisol comes down and your heartbeat comes down. So this becomes a new habit. I don't mean like you're chilled out. All, no, I don't mean that. But when you go on stage or you go to work, your brain is much more, you know, the red mist isn't there. That usually makes you, you know, you're trying to be funnier, you're trying to be smarter. Because the first thing that blows when you're stressed is your memory. That goes first. And so I wish kids in school would really learn somehow to cool their cortisol down, understand the chemicals make you, you know, aren't good for your health, and then take the exam, you know, because this pressure cooker 
is really what's going to, they say by 2020, it's going to be stress that wipes us out. It's going to be what? Twenty by twenty twenty, it's going to be stress that wipes us, that kills us. So screw all the Middle East stuff. We're going to just go that way. Well, listen. Let me just say, they're busy getting wiped out. We're getting wiped out because we're busy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's call the whole thing. Let's off. call the whole thing off. Speaking of which, that man there. Questions. Thank you, Miss Fisher. Say. Oh, thank you, thank Ms. you, Miss Fisher. When people get addicted to drugs, uh, whether it be medication or street drugs, they go through post-acute withdrawals after pause. Um, that follows with depression. And I was wondering, when you were talking about mindfulness, uh, would that help the, with the pause? Because I've read, on, I did some research on pause, and it's pa actually pause. the neuro. Pause. Yeah, pause. Yeah. pause. Meaning hold. Uh, pause, no, a post-acute withdrawal syndrome. Uh, Eric, you want me to say it again? Ask yeah. the question? <clears throat> now, I'm confused. With drugs, obviously, you have withdrawal. What does that have to do with depression? Uh, your body is basically, what, after you detox, Yeah. your body is basically trying to get back into shape, yeah. so you have pause, post-acute withdrawal. Okay, right. And, Came uh, back just in time. <laughs> But that doesn't maybe, maybe she could... Uh, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, but yeah, maybe uh, you could help. Uh, but uh, anyway, I, yeah. I don't I, know much about drugs. Uh, go ahead. No, no, go and let her finish. Yeah. Uh, but you're talking about mindfulness. Yeah. And with uh, post-acute withdrawal syndrome, or what, it, I, you get depression. And you fall very deep into depression, right. uh, whatever uh, drug you're addicted to, even though you detoxed. Right. And so you're asking what mindfulness has, to, how that if comes If it in. could help. Do if you it, have that? Uh, do I have, yes. Well, <clears throat> now or uh, we're out? Uh, no, I'm like just about getting out, but I could, I'm, I'm in it. Well, yeah. it, it, the thing about it is, there is, again, everybody wants a miracle pill. You know, some, like, save me, heal me. The, the, the thing about, um, uh, the, the, at least with me, with mindfulness, yeah. is it, it, I haven't had depression for seven years, but I'm not saying bully for me, because if I have it tomorrow, I'm going to sue you. <laughs> but uh, what, what it does do is we were talking about stress on stress and anger on anger. You know, it's those layers that make you even, you know, that add the shame and add the who can I blame and add the this. That does have... Um, you know, the agitation makes things even worse and, and screws your immune system. So just by doing so something where you understand you face the problem rather than run away is, is the mindfulness bit. Now, I can hear the early warnings. I can't, when you're in the midst of an illness, forget it. You know, people say, get up and, you know, you should jog, you should eat. When you're in the midst of sickness, forget it, you're a log. And if yeah. people say, perk up, like, perk up, because I didn't think of that, they should go screw themselves. But when you're better, in order to kind of, you know, you're building your resistance, just the way somebody would start, you know, pumping iron, is at least now I can hear when, when the thoughts are starting to change, the early, like an animal before it, it gets the earthquake. I can tell when it's coming, and then I can do things about it. Maybe before you get into your addiction, you'd know early enough you could call somebody and say, lock me in the house. You could do... Something to just, you know, you've got that muscle now to be able to tell. And you've also been trained not to give yourself a beating when you do have those abusive voices. That's the whole mindfulness thing, is to say, okay, this happens to everybody. These are this bullshit. I'm not good enough. Nobody likes me. My mother was right. That's my theme song, okay? Am I going to run from it or just let it play and go, come on, you know, bring it on. When you face them and you listen to them, it's nothing. There, it's, it's transient. Thoughts don't exist. You'll never stop hearing them, though, but you have a different relationship with them. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thanks. Do you, Thanks. Are, are you doing stuff about being post uh, uh, addicted? Uh, pause. Uh, honestly, you, no, uh, but I am, I'm a recovering addict. And so what are you doing about that? So of not like I'm. I need to stop this where I was like so many years ago. Yeah. 
years ago, and I would think, I need to stop this, this is ruining my life, but I had an epiphany more so of just like, it's time to get off. It's time to find your tribe, though. It is like what she was saying. You have to get with people that also and have this so you can dialogue with it and find out other cope. Also, the thing is, too, as you mentioned that, uh, that's not going to cure addiction. Okay, no, it's not. It's not. I know they say it, but I and I did punch up screenwriting, so you know. Uh, my question is, when you uh, reach sorry, your, can we see you? I'm here. Oh hi. When you reach your tipping point and you start to develop this muscle that helps you kind of like realize everything, how do you? Um, where do you go? What do you do once you've realized it? Is it meditation or? How do you, you know, deal with things? Um, when there's sensory overload, yeah. you realize Well, it. Uh, again, listen, nothing is 100%. You know what I mean? Otherwise, I'd be on Oprah. Right. Uh, <laughs> sounds like we, I'll be on Oprah, like on heroin. <laughs> hey, man, I'm on Oprah. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, detox from that one. Um, <laughs> it is, uh, it is, again, when you are kind of awake, you know what I mean? Now you're learning to pay attention. I know that and people say, what's with attention? I pay it. And I go, oh, yeah, we'll eat a piece of chocolate. You'll taste the first one. By the fourth, your mind is in Yugoslavia. <laughs> or people get somewhere and go, did I just drive here? Right. Or even you look in a mirror and you think, did I just have a life? <laughs> so with this, you learn to, you, the whole exercises to learn to focus, but not focus all over here, to focus really what's going on in your mind, which again, is that's usually why people get busy. You don't go up your own ass, you don't do it all day, but for a few minutes a day, you know, when you look in and you maybe anchor yourself with your breathing, the cortisol comes down. Incrementally, it comes down, it'll go back up again, you're not going to stay like that. So now you're using that muscle to hear where are you right now. You know, you check the weather outside, you're checking the weather inside. So sometimes when I've done my eighth, you know, uh, spam to talk about ask, responding, do I want to buy one of those, you know, toilets that you can use in the shower? Um, and I'm answering that because I can't stop because we are all natural born addicts. Forget the drugs. Adrenaline is one of the most addictive. You know, we get some, we want more. And I, we create situations to get ourselves jacked up like that. But you will hear eventually the warning signals. Like the, only, the reason I did mindfulness is because I missed my kid's childhood. You know, the, I was on the phone the whole time. I couldn't, I even wore the speaker once under a Santa beard, <laughs> thinking they wouldn't see that. So my kids now say, or they were saying, well, what was I like at seven? And I go, don't tell me, I know the name. <laughs> So I, because of practice, practice, sometimes I, I can feel, wait, 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 I'm still typing. They can see that. And with supreme effort, I can get that thing down and actually be pr and focus on them. Because people can tell when you're really there. They can smell it. And so I have the pleasure now of actually talking to my kids. I know what they look like. Um, and that's the, the point of mindfulness. If you want to do it another way, do it another way. But you really have to look in all the time. The answer is now there. You want to come? Hi. Hi, Davy. Um, I was lucky enough to move to England in 1985, and I started watching Girls on Top, and it was just so nice to to always see you there. I was there for almost two decades. And I had a hard time finding good mental health carers in England. They didn't believe they in didn't adult ADHD. They didn't even brush ADHD. their teeth when I first got there. <laughs> <laughs> they do now? They have caps. And um, did you have a hard time finding people to help you? And is that why you went to Oxford looking for answers? <laughs> That, that's not why people go, go to Oxford. Um, <laughs> but uh, I never told anybody I had mental illness. So I just would go to bed for days at a time. You know, that feeling. Because she's actually, I, they thought I had a blood disease. You know, they didn't know what this thing was called. And in my mother's day, they called it a turn. Or, you know, they said, right. oh, she's having a change of life. And I, yeah, for 87 years. 
so then I had blood tests, and this one I remember said, um, uh, they told me I had Epstein Barr, and when I told her, she said, Epstein Barr and Grill. I love that. <laughs> her. Roseanne and Epstein Barr <laughs> walked into themselves. <laughs> those illnesses, there's so many of those illnesses that people have, and it's always, they're always depressed, but they have. They call them that. Yeah. Yeah. I forget what there's some of them. It's not lupus. No, M. M anyway. Another one. Yeah. What is it? M. E. M. E. Just as narcissism. Or sad. <laughs> or sad. It's it nice. stands for something. I sense but it's really also sad. Yeah. Dreaming. Okay. Anyway, there was uh, there was there was no doctor, or, and so I didn't even know. But then finally, one said, "You know what? You've got clinical depression," because I was. Uh, I was nine months pregnant, you know, and um, it, and no, nothing was shifting. You know, I was so sick that they said your waters are drying up. <laughs> There's yeah. that vaginal That's dryness that again. <laughs> it's the theme. Anyway, I, I, you know, I couldn't figure out what I had because, again, there's no instruction manual. Right. You know, it's that kind of thing like you've. Um, it, it's like you're in a coma, but you're awake. It's it's it could be you were drugged. It's really confusing, and you only have one brain, like there's no spare one to make an assessment. So it's real. I had to finally ask a friend, do I look crazy to you? And she said, yes. <laughs> so then, uh, luckily. Even asking that question has the answer in it. <laughs> <laughs> I had money so I could go to the Priory. But if you don't have money, you're fucked um, well, that's in England. General. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, I, I had insurance, but that only lasted um, I, here too. It, it last it lasted six weeks, and then you're thrown well, out. They give you uh, insurance for physical illness. I always think yeah. it's funny. Like this is not that's physical. not physical. Yeah, it's covered with the anyway. Same stuff. Yeah, no, but they do that here. It's like you have to choose here. I think between whether you want to treat a physical ailment like you have heart disease, or would you like to deal with your schizophrenia. And then they play that music. <laughs> That's always playing. But they, 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 mental illness you can only have for a couple weeks. That's the law. And I'm, I'm just saying that. Great. I wish someone told me these that. These women, when I, I knew when they were, when I went into the Priory, there were these women that had EC, you know what, ECT, is it? Yes. And then they, insurance ran out. I remember this. They, they made them it. leave the building. Their heads were still smoking. Stop it. <laughs> That's not a good thing There was thing a to woman, say. though, that had to do Naughty, had to naughty, leave. naughty. Because they make ECT very scary for people. And, and it, it actually is a, a quick solution to a, a, yeah, for a lot so of people. quick situation. Yeah. When they do it all the time. Every movie you see, they have ECT is used by the staff of hospitals as a punishment. Just. All the time, the one that Angelina did. Yeah. They were about to give her ECT, and we're all supposed to be going, no! And it's like, oh, I lost. It always happens. Anyway, it, and so it, yeah. that has stigma that really doesn't. Well, it all, it all has stigma. But that's really serious. Yeah. But then don't tell anybody. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> no, it actually is very effective. Oh, but I'm not, anyway. Hi there. Electroconvulsive therapy. I'm Hi. up here. Hi. Hi. I um, have a question about uh, your thoughts of, about pharmaceutical drugs and how they fit in and how, and how successful they are in treating depression, for example, or even any other mental illness. Well, you know, uh, it's all we've got. And it's, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's guesswork. Um, but then so is chemotherapy. It's like, you know, there's a, a tree that's sick in the forest, so they set the whole forest on fire. I don't know what damage it'll do to me. Maybe I'll live 20 years less, but I'd rather be on that medication than ever go there again. So um, it works with me, I'll tell you that, but <clears throat> I, I'm sure it has a little to do with the practicing the thing because I had relapses and I've been on it for 20 years. Do you think you have a cure? I mean, it's. I personally do, yeah. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> I mean, are, are you. I don't no, know I think means. all of it is, has its usefulness. Um, 
I don't think there's one answer to yeah. any of it, just like there's no, but I think talking helped when that was fashionable. No, but I went to therapy and talked about it and learned stuff there. I took a lot of medication for a long time, and at a certain point I got frightened that I, I was underneath all of that, like <laughs> millions of quilts of not carry, and so I, I still have a fantasy of, I've gotten down to as low as I can, but it is, it is, it is a, a useful tool. And, and so is ECT, there, you know, a lot of these things, it depends on the person. But you know, it's and the they, only disease where, um, where there's shame about taking it. I said, well, if a diabetic says, I'm going off the insulin, I'm too embarrassed. They would no, be considered no, as insane. I'm saying this stuff about ECT, I'm saying to myself, oh, fuck. Don't talk about this again. This is stupid. Because you get in, you know, because people will think you're crazy. But really, licorice is the answer. No, it is, but it's, it, I forget sometimes that, that it's, that it's not, it's unspoken. Yeah. But, um, you know, she has to tell you, I'm not an expert on ECT. Mantle, uh, uh, ECT? It no longer, there's no convulsions any longer, so they should call it ET, which brings it back to a science fiction film, again. And um, so they basically, they put you out for nine minutes, maybe. Your toe might wiggle, but you're not there to see that. And they put uh, these little sort of, you know those little round bandages? They, they put that there, it's not even like electrodes. It's so, so different now. There's no, mm, there, there's no convulsion. So they put you to sleep and they just, it's like a little electrical current. But there is new on the market, this electro um, uh, simulation therapy where they'll put a, <clears throat> for people that can't, can't be cured any other way, they put a little chip in and it hits an area that's what they're trying to do. And they can always find you, too. <laughs> <laughs> and you won't get through customs. Right. Well, I, but, you know, to me, why is, why is one cruder than the other? You know, imagine what medication really does. But that's so, so fast. That works so fast. And I had to get close to being suicidal. I've never been suicidal. I, I've been to where I'm not pleased about being alive, but I would not consider the alternative. But uh, that, I felt like it just kind of blew apart a sort of Stuckness. cement of grim, you know, yeah. it's sort of like a bad day in uh, Russia, Russia countryside. No, but I mean really, really grim, and it, and it does do something, and it does it that fast, and I, I always feel bad when I hear that someone has committed suicide and had not checked that. Mm. I, I was in a mental hospital visiting people, they're leaving. And uh, the one woman said I was going to kill myself. And I thought, well, maybe I, I'll try ECT. If it doesn't work, I can always go back to killing myself. Did it, That and was it your worked. advice? That oh, was no, what she, she did. She tried it. She'd come in, and she got an ECT, and it would work. Wow. But that was her. That's yeah. the only. She had to get to that. That's where I got to. You're not going to go and just do it. Why? It's yeah. embarrassing. It's humiliating. You're a monster. You know, you really have to be. Well, you know, you, everything's out there. You, you have know what to someone called everything. me in England? A mouth breathing, window licking liberal. And I had to find out what that was. I don't know what it is. Basically, retarded. Okay. Mouth breathing, window licking liberal. Keep that one in mind. What is better than saying that? It's an I, onomatopoeia. Well, who knows? That's the one thing. What does that have to do with ECT? That's the problem. We have a question. We have a question. Obviously, it, it makes you I skip can... a few things. <laughs> Months. <laughs> Years. You know, I don't know where my memory has gone, whether it's the LSD, the ECT, or AGE. <laughs> <laughs> and our next question. Hi, Ruby. Um, hi. Where are you? I'm right here, standing up. Oh, hi. Hi. Now, what I want to know is what the relationship is between what you think, for you, mental illness and your sense of humor, like where they meet. OK, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Ruby? Yeah, yeah, I am. OK, yeah. so I want to know that. No, I wasn't interested in that. 
I want to know that. And then I also want to know how you make yourself be funny and be on when you're feeling like shit. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm a little uh, defensive about, you know, that uh, where funny and where mental illness touch each other because I, it's, it's one in four, which means, you know, Mrs. Somalia and Mr. Mumbai, it's one in four. So they're not that many funny people. Um, but, it, you know, a lot of people in show business are narcissists or neurotics or other things. But the mental illness, it's like saying, do all weather girls get shingles? Do all what kind of girls? Weather girls. Oh, they do, yeah. But, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a crossover with mental illness and, uh, and comedy or entertainment. I, I just, you know, think of all the comedians all over, you know, that you don't even they all, see. They all seem very depressed and mentally ill. Well, <laughs> You I'm can't depress I mean, you have to know you act you have to know them. <laughs> They're very actually very normal in real life, which is a little yeah. know, it's um, past Burbank. You know, they may express their emotions more, uh, so you, you would you know feel Maybe uh, you know that they're on. They're putting their stuff on the table, but one in four in here who just learned to shut up. Um, mental illness is really different than being sad. You know, sadness and mourning are part of the human palate, but mental illness is a sickness in the brain. And you can't choose to be funny. That's also you can't say, "Oh, today I'm going to be funny because I'm depressed," and talk myself out. <laughs> yeah, if you were, if we were sick now, you'd really be wasting your time here tonight. Because you'd see this, and I don't know where she'd be on the ceiling. <laughs> but we're not sick at this moment. So, uh, you know, people say the, the, the laugh, I just happen to do that for a living. But my insights really don't know what my outside does for a living. There's no connection. Don't tell them. No. <laughs> you know, people, uh, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. That's just my opinion. And our final question for the evening. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about evolution of the human brain and how that relates to the, the necessity for us to tune into our senses to sort of shut off that cerebral cortex and to sort of go back and be primitive a little bit in order to stop the modern day craziness. Mm. So. Um, the, you know, the cerebral cortex is a gift and it's a, also a kick. Um, w when we were just you know, out there on the bush, we were instinctive. You know, you would look, you would be vigilant. You'd look for danger. You when this language came on, it started to be translated. Tell me if I'm being clear or not. Into oh my God, I shouldn't, I can't, I'm going to screw up. Now it was <laughs> every cell in your body is fighting for your survival. It couldn't give a shit about your happiness. So we have a leaning more toward that gabbling voice. Uh, which really is just trying to keep us out of the road and you know c protect us. But again, in a society where everything is sending more and more fear signals, those voices are coming in much harder and heavier than they ever did. I mean, probably when you know when we were peasants, <laughs> we weren't that cruel to ourselves. You know, you, it, it was we were part of nature. You know, you you milked a cow, you did whatever, you went to sleep. If there was an enemy, you you dealt with it. Now we can't tell. Honestly, the inside of your brain cannot tell. It's just in a high level of fear. Whether it's Ebola this week and next week there's a flying saucer and then there's whatever, we're, we're, we cannot get that agitation down. So I always say, you know, uh, evolution didn't prepare us for this. So you have to learn techniques. If it's, maybe it's biofeedback, maybe it's Tai Chi, maybe it's whatever, but we have to start recognizing wh what our minds are doing and knowing when to cool them down. Also, when to, you know, when to perk them up. I mean, this whole thing of self-regulation is like driving a car. Sometimes you need to be in first gear, and sometimes you need to be in fourth. But we have to take over the wheel now. That was not in evolution. It worked perfectly well when we were in the wild. But we never, you know, inside our brains, it's still a caveman brain, but we're living in total fear. So this is something that has to be taught. We're, you know, we're not going to evolve we don't need six fingers. So the next time we evolve, it'll have to be something we did on purpose, something we did consciously, rather than just um, 
for the sake of bettering the machine. The machine isn't really working. Thank you very much. Was that, a good, was that an answer? Yeah. Okay. Never we never did our song. To you. We never did.